Good morning, Pastor John Davis, Amityville Community Church. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do want to thank you for this day. We thank you for your kindness, your love, your mercy, your grace. You're just a wonderful God. We thank you for sending your beautiful son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we ask now as we explore your word that you would grant us wisdom, understanding, that you would help us to to just know your word in its proper form. Pray that what is said would be pleasing in your sight, glorifying to your name, encouraging uh, to those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. For the next few sessions, I'd like to be exploring the topic, what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. What the gospel is and is not. In our current evangelical climate, we often hear phrases such as, Accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. We may hear God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. We hear terms like un unconditional love. And when someone is evangelizing, witnessing, trying to lead someone to Christ, they may even ask him to say the sinner's prayer. So we want to explore to see if these concepts are biblical, if they're based on scriptural truth, or are these uh, devices, methods that we've employed uh, that have varied from scripture and have employed for, for whatever reasons it may be, good intentions, misunderstanding of the scripture. So the first one I would like to explore today is the sinner's prayer. When a person is seeking to lead someone to Christ, you might hear them say or ask someone to recite a prayer. And sometimes that prayer is referred to as the sinner's prayer. The question is, can this be found in Scripture? Well, I want to caution, cautionarily, that's a word, with caution say, Yes, it is found in Scripture, but the way we employ it may not be the way it is found in Scripture. There is something called the sinner's prayer in Scripture, but the way we employ it may not be found in Scripture. So I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 9. Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 9. And we read the following in our Father's Word. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithe of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we read this passage in the Gospel of Luke. Now, since we're focused on the evangelistic portion of the use of the sinner's prayer, we will not go into detail into all the truths and principles and concepts that are found in here. It's quite a bit on humility and the, the attitude of prayer. But I would like to at least explore just briefly this parable that Jesus has spoken and the portion referred to as the sinner's prayer. And we could see that in verse 13, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what we can see, what we can see from the sinner's prayer is that, first of all, 
when we ask someone to recite a prayer, when we ask someone to say some words that we believe uh, is going to give them a, an entrance into heaven, that's the best way to put it, really, because we often find, whether it's a pastor, a deacon, and uh, a well-meaning uh, Christian saying, pray this prayer and God will save you. Well, we want to be careful of that. First of all, it is Jesus who is here saying that the man is justified. It is no one else but the Lord and Savior himself. So when we start promising someone that because they've said a prayer that they are saved, we need to be very careful. If we really examine the scripture closely, you never really see Jesus telling anyone to recite a prayer. There's a difference between a prayer that is provoked by the conviction of sin, that is provoked by one's own recognition of one's depravity and transgression. There's a difference than me saying to someone, recite these words. If you will notice in this particular parable, no one instructed this particular sinner to recite a prayer of his own volition, no doubt under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he brings forth this confession of his own iniquity. But please notice the attitude and even the physical demonstration of his sorrow. He says he would not even, the parable says, he would not even raise his eyes to heaven. Oftentimes we have someone recite a prayer and it could be quite mundane, somewhat rote, ritualistic. Uh, they're reciting words. This man, as he says this prayer, which Jesus acknowledges, not simply the words, but no doubt the attitude, the man felt too humiliated to even look toward heaven. Oftentimes in our evangelistic climate, when someone is reciting this prayer, we must be intellectually honest and confess that the attitude is not one of this type of remorse where the person feels so inadequate, so woeful, so sinful. They feel that, oh yes, I've done a little wrong. Let me um, say this prayer so I can get into heaven. Now please understand, if someone has this heart of repentance, if someone has this remorse, if you're familiar with 2 Corinthians chapter 7, there's a godly sorrow that brings repentance. There's a sorrow of the world that leads to death, but, the, but there's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So what we have here is not only did the tax collector feel totally humble, so much so that he couldn't raise his eyes. But it says, please note, he beat his breast. Now, when was the last time that you witnessed at one of these evangelistic campaigns after a church service, a pastor, a deacon will get up and say, oh, these people are saved. Did anyone see anyone beating their breast? Now, not to be too... Uh, confining toward the specific specific um, physical demonstration, but we have to admit that this person, this tax collector, was quite passionate about his sorrow, his grief, and his remorse. See, when we encourage people to say the sinner's prayer, if we're going to use the template, the paradigm, as it were, that's found in uh, the Gospel of Luke, then we also want to be mindful to use the whole context of this passage, that there is extreme sorrow, extreme humility, and extreme repentance for their sin. And please notice how the man identifies himself, God be merciful to me a sinner. I would dare to say if anyone had this attitude and said those words, absolutely God would forgive them and save them. But again, we must remind ourselves that oftentimes 
we see no physical, and this man did demonstrate physically uh, a sense of repentance and remorse. So we want to be careful of quickly rushing people into a false sense of repentance, a false sense of God's approval um, by using simple words, but the words are not the sole context of this prayer. Please notice the attitude of humility, repentance, remorse, grief, conviction, and sorrow. And please note that the man did not have anyone tell him to recite the prayer. So I would encourage all of us, if we are seeking to lead someone to Christ, evangelize, if we're seeking to witness, that we want to be mindful of representing the gospel in its entirety with accuracy and not diminishing it whatsoever. On a similar note, I would like to also bring up at this time, it, it's somewhat related toward the sinner's prayer. I'd like to bring up a passage in Luke chapter 23, verse 39. This is the thief on the cross. Now, I say it is related. While it's not usually identified as the sinner's prayer, there is another scenario which we may find uh a bit more common than appropriate in our current climate. We have a loved one, relative, friend, someone is ill. They're ill. They're very ill. Reports are it may be terminal. And a well-meaning believer, disciple, a well-meaning Christian rushes to the hospital to try to lead someone to Christ. And they encourage the person that the end is near. They exhort them and lead them in some type of prayer. They say some words and a person may walk away thinking they've led someone to Christ. That person in the bed may very well think they're saved. But if we're going to use the thief on the cross as a as it were, a, um, a proof that someone could be saved at the last hour, which no doubt somebody could be saved at the last hour. Pastor John is not saying that God has a limit on when somebody could be saved. Somebody can definitely be saved at the last hour. But please, again, look at the full context of the passage so that, again, we will employ and utilize and implement methods of evangelism that are faithful to the scripture, accurate to the gospel, and properly represent the teaching that is found in the word of God. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So we have here a clear example of a man, a thief on a cross, and he is saved. Jesus assures him. Now, please understand, in the parable of the tax collector and in this particular passage, it is Jesus who is assuring these individuals that after they have spoken their prayer that they are saved. We want to be careful because a prayer is only valid when the state of the heart and the position of the soul is proper before God which is something that we do not know. We want to be careful of assuring people that their prayer is automatically accepted without giving them a proper framework of the position of the soul, the heart, and the spirit of conviction and remorse. So notice the thief on the cross. 
we'll refer to him as that for now. First of all, again, very significant. No one prompted this thief. No one prompted this criminal. No one prompted, no one prompted, must I say it again, no one prompted him to ask Jesus to be saved. See, in both cases, the Holy Spirit is able to save people. The Holy Spirit is to provoke enough conviction that an individual will plead for God for great mercy. When we often, in, and, and I want to be careful, we often can manipulate people, pressure people into reciting some prayer that really has no true meaning in their own mind, heart, soul, or spirit. And so we see with the, the criminal on the cross, as a response to one thief who is mocking and blaspheming the great Lord Jesus, this thief now responds with rebuke and correction. Again, Jesus did not ask him to come to his aid, but we could see that the Holy Spirit is at work in this criminal. And now after he rebukes this man, this thief, Notice what he says. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Verse 41, and we indeed justly. This criminal recognizes, and interesting, he recognizes that he deserves to be on a cross. Now, if we are going to be quite honest about the terms of salvation, we have to remind individuals that they deserve hell and death. Nothing short. Not that they deserve just separation from God. We don't like to use the word hell. We don't like to use the word judgment. We keep referring to you'll be eternally separated from God, a term, by the way, which Jesus never employed. Jesus never told anyone they would be eternally separated from God. He did tell individuals that they would go into a lake of fire where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He did use terms like outer darkness and torment, but never this, this vague idea, and I do mean vague, of eternal separation from God. In one sense, we are already separated from God because of our sin if we have not repented. We are enemies of God, if you read Romans um, carefully. But all of that to say, so notice, the man says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Now, please understand the man's state of mind. He's on a cross, but he says, in no uncertain terms, he deserves to be on a cross. When a person recognizes that their sin is worthy of death, when a per person recognizes that their transgression is worthy of judgment in hell, no doubt God will grant mercy to that individual. No doubt. Because he's a merciful God. Repentance. Uh, Psalm 51. A broken and a contrite spirit is what the Lord desires. So as you look at this, again, this man who says this, as people would like to say, last minute prayer, deathbed prayer. He's not coaxed, coached, or provoked by any person. The Holy Spirit provokes him. And please notice the, 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 the theology he says about Jesus, but this man has done nothing wrong. So he recognizes the innocence of Jesus. He recognizes the sinfulness of his own life. And then he says, Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I don't want to belabor these points. I'm hopefully, hopefully they've come across with some clarity and uh, some uh, understanding. But you could see in both cases, no one told the tax collector or the thief on the cross to say a prayer. The Holy Spirit no doubt was convicting them of their sin. No doubt the Holy Spirit provoked them to recognize their utter depravity. And both cases, I mean, one man is on a cross and he's saying, I deserve to be on a cross. How many individuals have we assured that they're saved 
but they don't even believe that they're really that bad. They don't even believe that they're deserving of hell. And this man is on a course saying, we deserve, we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And notice he says, Lord, remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Obviously, this man has a sense that Jesus has a kingdom. I'm not sure how much he knows about the gospel. He may have heard Jesus teaching, but the the conversation, as you see on the scripture, uh, uh, on the cross, the conversation is recorded in the scripture between the thief and eventually the Lord Jesus. The thief really does all the talking. Jesus is doing no evangelizing at all. Have you noticed that? Jesus has done no evangelism. Jesus has not told the man he's a sinner. Jesus didn't say God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. We want to get to the place in our own spiritual conduct that we have confidence that the Holy Spirit, that the power of God is able to save individuals without us employing techniques and methods which are are not really faithful to the scripture. We want to know that God is able to save without any of us, even, even leading in one sense. Now, we are called to be evangelists. I am not saying that we should not evangelize. Please do not take that from this. But in our desire to be evangelistic, and dare I say in our, evang- in our desire to be successful, we start manipulating scriptural truth in such a way that we have individuals filling out decision cards and saying prayers that are really not based on a heart of remorse, and then we walk away thinking we've led someone to Christ, and often and tragically we've given people a false sense of assurance. How many people say, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ at a Bible camp, Oh, I prayed the sinner's prayer. They have not gone to church, are not involved in any type of discipleship, but we assure them that their reciting of a prayer has led them to be saved. So again, in the scripture, you see no apostle. You do not see the Lord Jesus ever telling someone to recite a prayer as a means or as a guarantee for entrance to heaven. Again, let me say that. Search the scriptures. You see neither Peter, Paul, John, Philip, Stephen, the Lord Jesus, none of them on any occasion in all of their evangelistic endeavors and ministries did they ever tell anyone to recite a prayer and then guarantee them that the reciting of the prayer led them to heaven. We don't see that in the scripture. This has been our first session in what the gospel is and is not. I hope you uh, find it helpful. Um, We'll be doing some more sessions specifically on this because I've pointed out one of the uh, erroneous ways that we can represent the gospel And we're going to look at a couple of others, and then eventually we will get to what is really the proper way to evangelize. And we have many examples in the scripture about evangelism. No need to employ methods that are not based thoroughly on the word of God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your evangelistic ministry. May you have an evangelistic ministry. for, For if we are believers of Jesus, we want to... We want to do what Jesus said, to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that he has commanded us. And lo, he is with us even to the end of the age. Amen. Be blessed in Jesus.